This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique <laughs> way. This is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. Dr. Crystal Dilworth is a molecular neuroscientist. Tonight, touch these lights. Tomatoes, basil, mint, and more, all growing under artificial light. The new farm inside an industrial warehouse near Chicago. Zero pesticides. We always get perfect plants. 98% less water. We've created Groundhog Day here. Who needs rolling fields and who needs the sun? You have a lot more red than you do blue. Yes. Why is that? Marita Davison is a biologist specializing in ecology and evolution. The wild paradise smack in the middle of a major American airport. That's all honey in here. Yes, would you like a taste? How conservationists are turning wasteland green. And using extraordinary measures to keep it that way. There it goes. I'm Phil Torres, I'm an entomologist. One, two, three, go. That's our team, now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Marita Davison and Dr. Crystal Dilworth. Because when you think of a farm in the Midwest, you think of seeing corn or soy fields as far as the eye can see, but that's not the case these days. Right, as space and resources become more and more scarce, farmers are finding innovative solutions to many problems. Farming is getting turned on its head all over the place, including going away from the fields and taking it indoors. Going indoors, stacking their plants vertically, and even growing their crops in the absence of sunlight. It sounds kind of like a science fair experiment, right? But it's not. It's actually commercially viable businesses, and I got a chance to take a look at two of them. Sometimes, Mother Nature is a farmer's worst enemy. If we don't get rain in a 30-day or so window, we'll be in pretty much dire straits. In California, three years of drought have forced growers to leave more than 400,000 acres unplanted at a cost of about $800 million in lost revenue. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, the worst floods in a century swamped more than 172,000 acres of crops in May, devastating the country's agricultural industry. Even last winter's polar vortex took a toll, as the bitter cold's impact on vineyards made big news in the Northeast. A crop crisis is growing along the Lake Erie shoreline. Some people say we have global warming, others call it global weirding, but the weather's been very volatile. But Robert Colangelo, founder of GreenSense Farms, isn't worried about Mother Nature. That's because he raises his crops here inside a 30,000 square foot warehouse less than 50 miles outside of Chicago. By growing crops in warehouses, indoor farmers say they can bring fresh local produce from farm to table in places like this in as little as 24 hours. What are some of the major advantages of indoor farming like this? We take weather out of the equation. We've created Groundhog Day here. Every day is consistent and it's the same. So we always get perfect plants every day. GreenSense Farms opened its doors in May, and already it's supplying 1,000 cases of produce a month to stores and restaurants throughout the Midwest. Tell me about some of the challenges in commercial indoor farming. There's no book. Nobody's really done this before. So we had to be innovative on every step. That pink glow is the result of one of the major innovations, more than 3,000 red and blue LED grow lights. Remember photosynthesis? How plants use sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to produce glucose? It turns out plants don't need the sun's whole spectrum to do it. They just need certain colors. These lights are specially made to uh, really nail photosynthesis for the plant. Lane Patterson is a senior grower at GreenSense Farms. Photosynthesis itself occurs at those two wavelengths, the red and the blue, 440 nanometers, 660 nanometers. And so what we're doing is we're saying, here's the light that you really, really, really like. Touch these lights. Feel how cool they burn up top? 
Yeah, they're not very hot at all. They don't generate a lot of heat, and you can put these uh, lights closer to the plant, and we could stack our trays uh, tighter. We have 10 levels. We can probably get 15. This is a uh, mint. Go ahead and taste that. Tell me how you like it. it. Smells so good. What's most amazing is how dark it is here, and then you pull it out into the light, you can see how green it became. Mm -hmm. Warehouse growers aren't the only ones turning to LEDs. Here at Purdue University, researchers are testing them in greenhouses to see if they can give plants a boost on short winter days. This opens up whole new possibilities. Carrie Mitchell is a professor of plant physiology and horticulture. We're showing that you can save uh, considerable amounts of electrical power using LEDs. And that's going to make it more economically feasible for greenhouse growers to grow plants like these high wire tomatoes in the off season. Researchers here are studying different light recipes by changing the intensity of light and the ratio of colors. In this display, you have a lot more red than you do blue. Yes. Why is that? That's a great question. We have about 95% red and 5% blue. If we have more blue than that, we start inhibiting leaf expansion, and we start inhibiting uh, stem growth. We actually think the higher blue might be valuable for improving the healthful attributes of tomato fruit, but not at this stage. Do you think that this is just a fad or is it a growing trend? Oh no, this is definitely a growing trend. The lighting technology will just continue to improve. The thing that's limiting it right now is the initial cost. Philips Lighting is subsidizing the LEDs for GreenSense Farms as part of a research partnership. They are also experimenting with light recipes for different plants. A year from now, I hope we have a light pattern that's very specific to basil and one that's specific to chives and to lettuces. And that's where you're gonna start to see us get a much higher optimization and more efficiency in our growing. So more efficiency in your growing, does that mean faster? What does that mean? It means faster, better, safer, cheaper. How? by being low on use of resources and high on sustainability. And that starts with the initial planting. Well, Crystal, I'm gonna show you how we seed today. Okay. Uh, we use a vacuum seeder. This is coconut core in a puck. And there's 105 pucks here. And so what I'm attempting to do is get a seed in every one of those pucks dead on. We use a ground up coconut husk, which is a renewable resource. It's inert. It doesn't have any bacteria or chemical properties in it, such as soil, but it allows the uh, plant to grow rapidly because it hydrates rapidly and it dries rapidly. So the water and nutrients can flow through the root system. We're recycling water and we're giving the plants just what they need. And it's kind of rolling around. Oh yeah, it does happen pretty fast, huh? And that's the excess. We'll look at it one more time. So nice and careful. Voila. They look like little eggs in a nest. That's the idea. About 42 days later, we'll have a head of lettuce. That's anywhere from 3 to 17 days faster than lettuce grown in a field, while using up to 98% less water and no pesticides. We don't apply anything to that plant. The water and nutrients go into the root system. Nothing ever touches those leaves. So when you uh, walk through the farm, you could eat the leaves right off the shelf. So we've kept this as a chemical-free environment. Diana Twyman is a client of GreenSense Farm. She picks up live basil plants once a week from Miller Bakery Cafe, her restaurant in Gary, Indiana. So I just need a little bit more for this batch. And then we're going to blend all of the ingredients together. It's the star ingredient for one of her most popular dishes, pesto. This is a dish that is built around large quantities of an herb that is typically hard to get in large quantities, hard to get all year round, hard to use cost effectively. And those problems are solved when you've got a local indoor farm. So excited. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> you go first. Okay. That's really amazing. Is that good? That is delicious. 
love it when I get to eat on camera. <laughs> now, was this something that was self-started by the farming community, or did it draw inspiration elsewhere? Well, um, interest in this type of indoor farming in the absence of sunlight, um, not surprisingly, was um, <clears throat> originally engendered by the marijuana growth industry. Really? Yes, but it's been co-opted by farmers that are using their approaches to um, grow basil and other types of high nutrient value crops that there's a, they struggle to get to the store um, in local and organic ways. Also note, with the marijuana industry, one of the ways they were getting caught is their houses were producing a lot of heat. And that's one of the other things that you saw in the piece is those LEDs don't produce a lot of heat. So that actually could have really pushed that energy efficiency, which is Exactly. If you think about designing your bathroom lighting or you designing your kitchen lighting, but they're designing lighting for basil. So we've seen the wonders of this basil, but what do you have coming up for us next? Well, next, I get to take a look at how basil plants and tilapia fish are living in harmony and doing it all indoors. For most of us, these are the images that come to mind when we think of farms. Rows of produce spanning out to the horizon, farmers using machines to fertilize their crops. But at this warehouse farm outside of Chicago, the rows go up and fish do the work of fertilizing the produce. One, two, three, go. <laughs> They're hungry. That means they're healthy. Paul Harday is the co-founder of Farmed Here. Imagine a pond with fish swimming in water and plants living around it. It's exactly what we're trying to replicate indoors. And it's a symbiotic relationship between fish and plants, and, uh, and that's how we grow our crops. These fish are part of an aquaponic growing system. The water from these tanks, complete with fish waste, flows through a system of filters. There, natural bacteria will break the waste down into nitrates before the water is cycled to the plants. Nitrates are the most available plant foods on the planet. So the nutrient-rich water from the fish tanks is moved onto the uh, area of our grow systems where the plants live. Uh, the plants take the nutrients, they actually filter the water, and the water recirculates back in the fish. This aquaponic system helped farm here become the only commercial indoor farm to be certified organic by the USDA. Do you need to add any other supplements or do the fish provide all of the nutrients? It depends on type of crops that we grow. Uh, our focus at this point is leafy greens. We grow basil, arugula, kale, variety of salad mixes, but we also had very successful trials with tomatoes, strawberries, and more heavy feeding plants. So at times you need to supplement. It's more like taking vitamins that, that both of us could take. It's kind of the same process. Produce harvested in this 90,000 square foot warehouse is destined for the shelves of more than 80 grocery stores in the Chicago area. So here you see uh, we're using fluorescent lighting. That's how we started about uh, four years ago. We're in a transition of uh, switching our lighting technology to LEDs. Farmed Here recently partnered with lighting manufacturer Illumitex to make the switch to LED grow lights. Harday hopes LEDs will help the company expand its crops beyond leafy greens. They have developed a, uh, a very good LED solution for the more demanding crops like strawberries and peppers and tomatoes. We strongly believe that this could be done very soon. Right now the fish are here merely to help you with the growth of the plant crops, but are you going to start farming the fish too? Yes, we will. Eventually we're going to start farming the fish and selling fish. Actually, we already uh, had some success selling fish to local restaurants. And as our scale grows and uh, we have more fish to sell, we hope to sell them to supermarkets as well. This is Thai basil, so it's got actually a little different flavor. Feel free to try if you would like to. It's my favorite, actually. Oh, it smells so it good. It smells different than Italian basil, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, there are only a handful of commercial indoor vertical farms in the United States, like Farmed Here and Green Sense Farms. But Professor Kerry Mitchell says he gets calls from growers every week wondering if they should jump in. On a commercial scale, where do, where do you see the application of this technology going? I see a continuous expansion, but it's, it's these are niche markets right now. Is there any limit to it? What about, you know, the traditional crops you think of, like corn and soybeans and rice? All of those things could be grown with LEDs. What becomes important is the economics of the crop. 
So it makes more sense to grow very high value crops in a controlled environment than a field crop. Traditional farming for commodity crops is still gonna be there for, for a long, long time, but you have to look at the economical equation because farming is technically subsidized. What would be the real cost of traditional farming? And what is the real impact on the environment of traditional farming? We're trying to build a for-profit model and show the world that we don't need to be subsidized. We can make, you know, stand on our own legs and make it economically viable. Do you think indoor farming will ever replace field farming? No, I don't. I think field farming, greenhouses, and indoor vertical farming will work in tandem in the future. Just as the uh, car has stratified with different fuel types, you're going to see that same stratification in farming. What would you say to somebody that said that plants are supposed to be grown outside in the sun? I would say that people said the uh, world was flat and, and we found out that it was round. Our quality is as good or better than anything you can grow outdoor and we're chemical free. My answer is smell it, taste it, eat it. Works for me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget the cheese. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> This is my favorite shoot. <laughs> my favorite story. So this whole complex system, all of it indoors. It's like a little mini ecosystem. And Marita, you've worked as an ecologist. What do you see when you look at something like that? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting how they've basically created a little mini ecosystem. That's not easy to do, right? But the question that I have is, whether or not this can scale and how complex it might be to do that. Because in ecology, at least, we build what we call microcosms, mesocosms, and macrocosms, right? Going from the small to the large. And they don't necessarily scale in a very straightforward way. There are lots of other factors that come into play when you try to bring a small system to a larger scale. So that, for me, is the biggest question whether they'll be able to do that and what some of those factors are going to be. A tomato is very difficult. Corn, even more so. Those commodity crops, they take a lot of energy and a lot of space to grow. And as I learned when I was talking with the farmers that are engaged in this process, they think that there's going to be a hybrid approach that will develop eventually, but we're never going to see the absence of those large, large, beautiful fields of corn. Guys, I'm an entomologist, and I like working with insects. One of my favorites are the bees, which may be in trouble. Right, I think of airports as being these huge places that are really destructive to wildlife, but it turns out that's not always the case. No, in fact, I got to take a tour at SeaTac Airport in Seattle, where they're taking steps not to just keep wildlife from striking aircraft, hence making us a little bit safer in the air, but they're also taking steps to make bees a little bit safer. So let's check it out. As one of the busiest airports in the Northwest, SeaTac International serves 30 million passengers each year. Although most don't realize, they're sharing airspace with a half million bees. We're standing in the middle of one of the three apiaries here at SeaTac Airport. Bob Redmond is the executive director of Common Acre, a nonprofit bee conservation group that's partnered with the Port of Seattle to form the Flight Path Project. The big goal for this project is to save the bee. Now, let's talk a little bit about why it's important to conserve bees. I mean, mm -hmm. tell me about colony collapse. Well, first of all, bees pollinate one third of everything that humans eat. And since 2006, there's a syndrome mostly affecting commercial beekeepers in which the colonies enter a, a, a doom cycle and they can't produce enough bees to survive. So those populations collapse. That's all honey in here. Yes, would you like a taste? David Feinberg is a SeaTac beekeeper. Just stick your finger right in like Winnie the Pooh. Oh, oh, wow. David's also in charge of the Queen Bee Breeding Program, currently underway. We want to develop local Northwest bees that are better at surviving the winter than the California bees that come up in the spring. Mm -hmm. And so we are here at the airport where we have a little green island. Vacant land surrounding an airport may seem an unusual option. But SeaTac's immense safety buffer, roughly 1,000 acres, 
represents cities' growing demand to find creative conservation solutions in the middle of heavily populated urban areas. And on this green island, we can, for the most part, control the drones that are in the air, and we can, can control the colony genetics. And so we can set up a situation where we can select our very best queens. Hopefully they will mate with our very own drones, and we are creating our own strain of SeaTac Airport, you know, flight path bees. <laughs> as carefully selected as these bees have been, and despite the fact that the colonies are capable of surviving the many challenges they face, please don't call them super bees. Because there is no magic bullet. The answer to the bee problem is not this huge, complicated, chemical, industrial thing. It's something that all of us can do. Plant flowers, no chemical inputs, and let your lawn grow an inch taller. That's the solution to making healthier bees, not a magic super bee. But conservation at SeaTac Airport isn't just about strengthening a species. It's also about keeping the more invasive ones out. For this, the airport has a wildlife biologist on staff. He's come up with some creative solutions. The reason we have the Coyote airboat is because we're finding that using the pyrotechnics alone, the noise bangers, the screamers, that they do work, but the wildlife, they get used to it. There it goes. When they have a predator coming after them, especially when we have this mock-up that looks like a coyote, they're less apt to uh, hang around. With natural wetlands just a few hundred feet from one of the airport's major runways, birds could be a huge problem, especially smaller starling flocks that can strike or get sucked into planes causing serious damage. So traps are set up around the runways. So this is the email that we got when the trap door closed. A system of email alerts and alarms let crews know when bigger raptors have been caught. Okay, let's go find that red tail and get it out of the trap. All right. Looks like it's ready to be somewhere else. Yeah, well, that's what's great about these texting traps is that we're able to go and, and get the bird out. This female hawk will be relocated to a safer green space about 70 miles away. She'll be tagged so crews can make sure she hasn't returned to the airport. So far, less than 3% do. And that is considered success for this team of conservationists. How has the public been responding to the efforts that you've got going on here? Overwhelmingly, the public response has been yay. We can't put houses here, but we can do something for conservation, and that's a big win. Now, one of the things I have to bring up is how amazing was that remote-controlled coyote on an <laughs> airboat? Who thought of that? It's crazy, right? So Steve Osmek, the wildlife biologist at, at SeaTac, this is his idea, and it is pretty brilliant. I mean, the fact that you can scare birds away from the flight path of, of the planes using this model of a coyote on a motorboat is amazing, no, but we one, saw it. We saw it work. As you and I know, conservation work in the field should be fun. <laughs> you should be coming up with these creative ideas, so I loved watching that. <laughs> I'm jealous of you guys. You get to actually do field work. Come along anytime you want. We'll find something fluorescent in the Amazon, and I'm sure you can study it. That sounds great. Well, thanks, guys. Really interesting stories. And if you want to see more, be sure to check us out next time on Tech Now. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.